Okay. Hello. Hello and welcome to the New York City Category Theory Seminar. It's November 11th. Today, Noah Crane is speaking. He's from the University of Maryland. He spoke last year in our seminar and uh, also about ontologies and he's gonna speak today on Yoneda ontologies. Great. Fire away. Thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you for hosting the seminar again this semester. It's been wonderful so far. Um, so I'm gonna talk about Yoneda ontologies. And uh, before I get into um, the mathematics of it, and I promise there'll be some mathematics of it, um, I want to tell you about the dream that I have behind um, why I'm doing this. Okay. So um, if you by the fact that, uh, that the physical structure of your neurons um, somehow conjures up consciousness, you may be led to the question of how does the structure of your neurons actually represent a thought? Um, and, you know, so the first question is, what is the structure of your neurons? I'm not gonna get close to answering that question. Um, but for the sake of argument, let's say it's a graph. Uh, how does a, um, an activated subgraph of your neurons represent a thought like an apple? Um, so that is what I originally talked about um, last semester at this seminar is how we correspond formally diagrams in a category um, or in some other version of a collection of things which I'll call ontology. How do we associate diagrams of things to actual things? Um, and you can think of it in the same way that you take a subcategory and you take its co-limit and you get an actual object. Um, in that sense, we are associating to that subcategory, this giant diagram of things, uh, an actual thing, okay? So, let me say a little bit more about what an ontology is, in my view. <clears throat> so um, it, it's human nature to attempt to categorize things uh, based on their type or whatever. So inherently, when we look at an apple and we say it's an apple, what we're doing is we are collecting it in some giant category or uh, set of apples and we are saying it's part of that set. But really, an apple is not necessarily an element of the set apple, it is the entirety of its complicated structure, all the little dimples it has or all the atoms it has, whatever you wanna uh, consider. Um, so it's human nature to do this. Every human categorizes things. Um, now, mathematicians, arguably also humans, um, categorize things in very highly expressive ways. So, um, for example, throughout history, we have collected points in a topological space. And this is expressive because although the points in a topological space are formal elements of some set, they don't necessarily mean anything, um, we can express continuity in a topological space. We can express operations um, in groups or other types of algebras. Um, if you look at an element of a vector space, from the most formal perspective, it is just an element of a set. And yet we look at that element and we say, oh, it's uh, a direction uh, or it's a vector. Uh, we interpret it in some way based on the fact that it is a member of some expressive collection of things. And the most notable example of this is a category. I mean, if you think about it, formally, uh, like you take a small formal category, the elements of this category are just objects. I mean, we're lucky if we even give them labels. They are just points. And yet we can claim to understand them as having structure. Uh, we talk about the category of topological spaces. Um, what you know makes it a topological space as opposed to just an arbitrary object? Uh, or you know, we talk about the category of groups, et cetera. Okay, so in general, when I say ontology, um, I mean all of these things and more. 
it's just an expressive form of collecting data. So a topological space is an ontology, a group, vector space, categories, or ontologies. Um, but it seems like categories are pretty special, right? So what makes categories special? I mean, all ontologies are good for expressing something about what they contain. Um, so why did we choose categories to contain theories? Why do we talk about the category of topological spaces? Why do we talk about the category of groups as opposed to the group of spaces or the set of spaces or, or something else? So there are plenty of answers to this question, um, but you know, categories aren't really even special in this, um, in, in this sense. Uh, there, there are other theories that need something better than categories in order to actually express what's going on. So for example, in homotopy theory, uh, in order to talk about higher coherence, we need to talk about simplicial sets. Um, in order to talk about higher morphisms, uh, we need to talk about n categories. In order to talk about both, maybe we have infinity n categories. So we have many different contexts in which our theories get more and more complicated and need to add stuff to our uh, ontologies to make them expressive enough to talk about what we're talking about, okay? Um, and so what this theory of UNEDA ontologies um, really is in, in the backbone is a way of allowing us to change um, the ontological structure in which we contain our theories or our meta theories, okay? So I just listed several things. Let me go back here. Um, Simplicial sets and categories uh, infinity n categories, multi categories. Uh, why am I calling all of these things categories? I mean, you ask me if a multi category is a type of category, I'd say, yeah, sure is. Um, so, among all the form of ontologies of which sets and spaces are included, why are um, certain ontologies considered categories? Um, and is it just the raw notion of morphism and composition? Well, you know, there is a, a definition of a category, a one category, where we have objects, morphisms, and we can compose those morphisms. Um, but as we go further into formal and higher category theory, um, these notions become really, really strange. Right? So we can't necessarily hold on to morphism and composition as a means of defining what a category is. Um, so my hunch uh, is that it's not really about the actual structure of a category, the morphism of composition. It's about the fact that we can understand objects uh, from other objects. So uh, one way to think about this in terms of, of a category is of isomorphism. I, you know, I understand one space, not because I actually know anything about that space, but because I know a space that's isomorphic to it. Um, or I have maybe some very complex object, and I want to break it down into simpler objects. Uh, and then I look at those simple objects, I take the co-limit, and I get back that original object. And I can understand something about that original object by breaking it down and taking the co-limit. Okay? So in order to actually get this into, um, into math, I need to change the way that I ask this question. So um, the way that I'm asking this question now is how do we understand objects via the ambient category? So what I can think of is like an isomorphism class. This is something in the ambient category around an object that helps me describe the object. Same thing uh, with diagrams. These are part of the ambient category and I can you know, take their co-limit to understand the object. Um, and most notably would be the Yoneda embedding. Um, so let's talk about the Yoneda embedding. So um, if you look at this third line here, the Yoneda embedding is you know, just formally an embedding from a category into uh, the pre-sheaf category. And it's going to send an object to the representable functor uh, on that object, okay? But what does the representable functor represent? 
well, it represents the morphisms into that object. And so I would say that that counts as the ambient category, okay? So um, we have these universal properties. We're understanding complex objects via diagrams. And we have the Oneida lemma. We're understanding objects via the Oneida embedding. Um, the formal, so universal properties, is my motivation for studying formal ontology. How do, we, um, how do we abstract this enough so that it happens in every context? Um, and the latter is the motivation for formal category theory. So uh, there are two papers that really motivate almost all the theory that I present in this talk. Um, the first paper is on Unita structures. Uh, that was by Street and Walters. Um, and the second paper is about virtual equipment, and that's uh, by Schulman and Crutwell. Okay, so I'll give you some links at the end of the talk. Um, all right. So um, one of the things that I talked about last time I was here was diagrammatic expansions or, or ontological expansions, as I called them. Okay, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of what an ontological expansion is. Instead, I'm going to show you some nice pictures, okay? So if I just zoom in here to this picture that I drew, okay, what is an ontological expansion? Well, on the left, I have some sort of graph. So I'll just call this a graph. Make this a little bit smaller. Sorry. Okay, so I have a graph on the left, for example, and this thing on the right are gonna be like the subgraphs. Okay, and I'm going to um, have a morphism from the graph into the subgraphs, and if I draw a picture of that, what that looks like is I take a element of my graph, a vertice, and I expand it into a subgraph. And I take uh, an edge of my graph uh, and I expand it into a collection of edges between the subgraphs, okay? So this is what an ontological expansion might look like, a diagrammatic expansion you could think of it like. Um, but if you just look at the, the structure of it, um, it is a map from A into some construction on A. And if you look at the UNATA embedding, well, it kind of looks the same. Um, if we just you know squint hard enough, it kind of looks the same. So both the UNA embedding and these ontological expansions are ontological transformations, as I'll define them in a minute. Um, so the point is that I want to rectify this notion of understanding an object via the ambient category. So that would be the ontological expansions. Uh, I want to rectify that with the Yoneda embedding. Okay, and the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to organize them all into some giant uh, virtual double category. Uh, and really, it's going to be a simplicial virtual double category that I'll call uh, ont for ontology. Okay. All right, so this talk has um, two parts, two star parts. So the zeroth part, I'm going to define for you what I mean by um, a basic ontology, um, and it's going to be a toy definition. Now, I want to be uh, super clear about this word toy because I am playing around with the definition for ontology, and I don't think it's going to be the ultimate definition of ontology. And the reason I don't think that is because I need to use two category theory to understand ontologies, and two categories in my book count as an ontology. So it's like I'm using ontologies to describe ontologies and that doesn't sit well with me. Um, what I'm looking for is like an ontology free description of ontologies and uh, well, that's the most confusing point of this entire theory. So uh, I'll just concede and use two categories for now. Then I'll talk about simplicial virtual double categories. Uh, a mild generalization of a virtual double category. And then I'll hopefully be able to define what a Yoneda transformation is in one of these simplicial virtual double categories. Okay, 
So here is what a basic ontology is. So a uh, basic ontology is just an object of a two category. Okay, um, that seems a little strange because uh, this two category, which is uh, script K, is, um, is not set. Like I can vary this two category. And when I vary this two category, what I'm varying is the type, quote unquote, of ontology. So for example, um, I can look at the two category of categories. Uh, categories are an ontology or simplicial sets or globular sets or topological spaces or even stranger things, okay? But the point is that they're part of some uh, two category, they're just an object in the two category. And the reason I allow myself to vary from two category to two category is that I don't wanna favor any version of ontology. Uh, both categories, simplicial sets, ordinary sets, uh, and topological spaces all sit as members of the same uh, big collection of, of, of things, okay? Um, and what this allows me to do, thinking this way, is it allows me to reason about um, changing between ontologies. So uh, what I'm trying to capture is like, when we started doing homotopy theory and we realized that we can't uh, compose uh, homotopies, we only can compose them up to homotopy, uh, we had to change from categories to simplicial sets. Um, and I see in the future, I mean, the way that formal category theory is going, that this will never stop. So um, I would like to come up with a system for, for how we upgrade our meta, meta theories. Okay, so one way to do that is via an ontological transformation. Um, so an ontological transformation from one ontology to another ontology, uh, basic ontology, B for basic, um, will be a diagram like below. So what's happening here is I have this one ontology, which I'll write on the left here, and I have this other ontology, which I'll write like this. Um, and then uh, these are in two separate two categories. And so what I can do is I can embed them into a mutual two category uh, in order to reason about them as the same thing and consider a map between them. So what that would look like is I have some functor on the left, some functor on the right, and I have a morphism between them. Now it's easier to reason about them in terms of this diagram than it is in terms of um, actual morphisms, okay? All right, so here are some examples. So um, this example, uh, the ontology on the left is going to be a graph, it's of type graph, and it's going to be a graph that includes some people and some friendship relations between those people. And the ontology on the right is going to be a Riemannian manifold. It's going to be um, the sphere, the two sphere with uh, the metric of the earth. And so um, this ontological transformation uh, first realizes the graph as a topological space, it's geometric realization. Um, and then it forgets the manifold structure of a Riemannian manifold and it maps one to the other. And this is like saying, uh, here are where my friends live on the earth, okay? Um, so here is another example. Uh, this is a prototype example because um, one thing, one point that I want to get across is that when we draw diagrams in some paper, we often assume that everyone knows what we're talking about, right? Um, so for example, if I look in a topology journal, I'm reading a topology paper, and I see um, a, a map that looks like this, right? Um, I'm in a topology universe, and so I'm just gonna assume that the thing on the left is the unit interval, the thing on the right is the real numbers, and this map is x squared. But if I'm being super honest, like for example, if this appeared in a formal category theory paper, I would say, oh, well, this is definitely just some random objects in some category. And even that is an assumption. So um, this 
ontological transformation is a little bit more honest. Um, I have a formal diagram. I'm not even labeling it. And I'm associating to everything in that diagram the actual objects in the category of topological spaces. Okay. Um, so one last example, and it's also going to be like a prototype example. So um, these are going to be uh, like, like diagrammatic expansions, and these are going to appear uh, throughout the talk, uh, just in pictures. I'm, I'm going to keep the formalism uh, to a minimum. But uh, if I look on the left, I have like micros uh, macroscopic objects and the forces between some macroscopic objects. And on the right, I have uh, microscopic particles and the forces between those particles. And so, for example, what this might look like is I have two uh, macroscopic objects, a, uh, uh, an apple sitting on top of a table and the force that the table exerts onto that apple. And I want to ask, like, what is actually happening in this, um, in this situation? Uh, well, in order to further describe what's actually happening, I need to expand the apple into its graph of apple particles and um, forces between those particles and same thing for the table. And then I have a bunch of forces here uh, between the table particles and the apple particles. And one could imagine that uh, maybe if I integrate these forces, I should get the macroscopic force back or something. But the point I'm trying to make is that um, throughout this talk, we're gonna be taking uh, very simple things simple diagrams and expanding them into really complex diagrams in order to better explain a situation. Okay. And every time that happens, we're going to be using this notation. Um, it looks like a less than or equal sign. It's a, like an expansion um, uh, notation. Okay. So you might ask like, where does the virtual double categoryness of this come from? Uh, well, it comes from the question of how we compose expansions. So um, if you look at this diagram um, and you look at this as a human, uh, you see that I have some point here. This is going to be in G. And I expand that point into a graph uh, in G prime subgraph. And then I take those points and I expand them even further into uh, subgraphs of G prime prime. And if you know anything about monads and the Claisley construction, you might assume that, well, after I do that double expansion, I can union everything together and apply some sort of uh, unit or co-unit of a monad um, in order to get my full diagram. But there's a lot more that's actually going on here. Um, first of all, uh, the the uh, ontological expansions, they look for marked uh, elements to expand. So this inner circle here is a marking that tells O to expand it. Um, and this O prime here doesn't know how to expand anything in this version of G prime because they're not circled. And so I need to do like a recircling. And so I have something which I'll call uh, alpha, which is like a recircling. Okay. And once I recircle things, then okay, O prime knows how to expand it and I can do everything else. Okay. So let's see what this looks like in terms of uh, actual diagrams. So um, if I write this more formally, uh, what I get is I mean, there's a bunch of uh, decorations that go on here, but I get this first ontological expansion, it's first diagrammatic expansion, I get this thing which I'll call a connective morphism. Um, and then I get the second ontological expansion. And then I have some sort of thing which might look like the co-unit. And uh, another thing which might look like the unit. If we're talking about this in terms of monads. Um, but as you can see, I mean, if you are being very careful, um, 
the unit is going the wrong direction. Um, and you might ask why that is. Um, well, it's because they're not part of a monad. They're actually part of a virtual double category like structure. So what do I mean by that? Well, these alphas are rather confusing. So let's squint really hard and get rid of them. So if I go down, sorry, let me skip that. If I um, squint really hard, I can get rid of them by packaging all the connective morphisms into a cell. Okay. Now, if you have worked with virtual double categories at all, you'll see this cell and you'll say, hmm, that looks like something that happens in a virtual double category. For those of you who haven't seen virtual double categories, essentially what they're used for is for understanding formal composition. So I have these uh, horizontal morphisms, these ontological transformation, which are very formal. There's no uh, immediate notion of composing them. Uh, but this alpha is giving me a formal means of composing them. Okay, so they're gonna, um, I'm postulating that they're gonna find their home in a virtual double category. Okay, but this is not actually the case. Um, we, need to, we need to shuffle around virtual double category a little bit to capture everything, but it's still worth reviewing. Um, so if you've seen virtual double categories, uh, this is gonna be quick. And if you haven't seen virtual double categories, hopefully this will be informative. Um, just to give the raw definition of a virtual double category, um, it consists of a vertical category. So that vertical category has objects and morphisms. Okay, and we're gonna say it's vertical because when we draw cells like this, they will appear as vertical. And we have a horizontal graph. Okay, this is a graph, not a category. Um, and so we don't have a notion of composition of the edges of this graph, uh, but that's the whole point of a virtual double category is that we're trying to give a formal composition to, um, to these horizontal morphisms. So they're horizontal because they'll appear as horizontal. And these formal compositions that I keep mentioning are cells that look like this. So we have a bunch of horizontal morphisms and we're saying like, how do we formally compose them? Uh, and so that's what this cell is saying, quote unquote. It's just an intuitive explanation of it. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna give you a example of a virtual double category. And that's not because I want you to understand virtual double categories. I mean, I do, they're great. Um, but it's because it's going to be a simpler version of the problems that arise uh, in ontologies, okay? So uh, we're gonna consider a co-complete category C, okay? And we can talk about the spans on C. So the spans on C form a virtual double category. The underlying category is just the original category C. And the horizontal morphisms are spans of objects in C, okay? And what a formal composition will look like, so we have a cell on the left, uh, we rearrange that and we take the, uh, the pullback of all of these cells. So if I look at this cell, it has um, a bunch of P's like this, and I take the pullback of those P's, and that's what I get here. And what this pullback allows me to do is it allows me to describe this alpha in terms of just a single morphism into the uh, span on the bottom, okay, so into Q. So the reason that this is a virtual double category um, is that the alphas have no extra information besides just alpha. Um, I don't need to provide you any formal information or connective structures like I did above in order to, um, to talk about compositions. I can just put two alphas uh, next to each other and compose them. Um, and, and that's the end of the story, okay? So the problems with ontologies are like what happens if you remove this co-completeness. 
So what does span C become when we have no pullbacks? Okay. So in place of a canonical span of spans, uh, so that would be the pullback. So the span of spans is this pullback. We're going to choose a span of spans, okay? Um, and this choice is gonna screw things up significantly. Um, namely, if we want to compose the cells, um, we actually have to choose how we compose the cells. Okay, so the key word here is choice. Um, and anytime you see the word choose and compose in the same sentence, you should immediately think of simplicial sets. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to make virtual double categories more simplicial. Okay, and it's going to turn out that this uh, weaker version of the spans and also the um, collection of ontologies and ontological transformations are simplicial virtual double categories. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about spans. So again, here is a cell um, uh, in, in this simplicial virtual double category. Uh, in, in order to talk about what alpha actually is, the data of alpha, um, I need to provide for you a pullback. Uh, provide for you a stand-in for the pullback. And that's going to be information uh, included with alpha. Okay, so alpha is no longer just the map alpha. It's also the choice of pullback um, or span of spans and the choice of maps from this pullback into the original uh, P's. Okay. And, uh, you know, the, the next diagram I'm going to show you is going to be even more complex. And so what I want you to keep in mind in order to keep this simple is a side view of this cell. So if I look at the side view of this cell, this looks like a one simplex, right? Uh, except for the fact that its domain is like a collection of P's as opposed to just a single P. Okay, so there's some Kleisley Thing going on here and I'll, I'll describe that precisely in a moment. So if we try to construct a two cell uh, in this category in this simplicial virtual double category of um, spans where there are no pullbacks, we'll get something that looks like this. Okay, so again we have a bunch of alphas, we have a beta and we're attempting to compose uh, the beta with all these alphas, okay? And the question is, well, how do we do that? Um, and the answer is we don't, because if we look at this from a side view, uh, well, what happens is I have actually a cell in the back that I wasn't able to draw because it's, you know, two dimensional representation. But if I look at it from the side view, I have um, a gamma, right? So here's a gamma, this gamma appears in the back. And these aren't composing on the nose. I'm not saying that alpha composed with beta equals gamma. There is some extra structure that witnesses this composition, right? So namely sigma, okay? All right. So, um, you know, let's not just take my word for it. Let's actually look at what's going on here. So if you look at these alphas here, here's uh, one alpha. Um, here is the P alphas, uh, the, the pullback, the choice of pullback that is associated to alpha one and the choice of pullback that's associated to alpha M. Okay. And here is our beta and here is this choice of pullback that's associated to beta. And here is uh, the choice of pullback that's associated to gamma. So gamma remember is behind. Um, and so I'm kind of spoiling this by showing you the blue sigma up here. But, um, you know, if I wanted to try to compose this, they're not even the same objects. The uh, P alpha is over here. How do I connect it to P gamma? Well, of course, I'm going to provide a span of spans of spans. Um, and yes, I can, I can tell that this is 
uh, a little too complicated, and so maybe I'll digress right now and just show uh, what this looks like if I collapse this diagram. So if I collapse this diagram, I get something that's even simpler. Uh, I just get some stuff that comes from sigma, some stuff that comes from beta, some stuff that comes from alpha, and some stuff that comes from gamma. And this is exactly uh, what's going to lead to the simplicial uh, structure of the simplicial virtual double categories. Okay, and now, you know, brace yourself because this seems complicated, right? But if I try to do this for uh, ontologies and ontological transformations in the simplest case, that is with a cell that I'm only composing by two um, distinct alphas, uh, I get a ridiculous amount of connective data that is required to talk about this composition. But um, I don't really need to care about that because if I look at it from the side view, well, I have a collection of O's up here. I have um, a collection, oops, sorry, a collection of P's um, over here. And I have a collection of Q's over here. And then I also have a collection of alphas and a, collect and, uh, a beta. Okay, so from the side, it sort of just looks like uh, a simplex in some weird version of a simplicial set. Okay. All right. So here's a question. What actually is a simplicial virtual double category? Sort of seems like this uh, span construction when we don't have pullbacks uh, needs to be a simplicial virtual double category, but what is a simplicial virtual double category? So uh, in order to approach this question, I'm going to talk about how we uh, create virtual double categories formally. So um, if you look at this simplex here, the brackets that I drew to denote collections or collections of collections of things um, isn't just some notational nonsense that I made up. It corresponds to a monad, right? Um, specifically, the free court category monad or the path monad, okay? So what is the free category monad? Well, we take a graph, we look at the paths in that graph, and we can compose paths, and so we end up with a category. And then we just forget that we can compose graphs, and we end up with a graph. And this graph is going to have uh, vertices as vertices, just ordinary vertices, but the edges are going to be paths of edges. Okay, so this is what's going to be inside of like FC of some graph G. Okay. So originally, um, virtual double categories were called FC multi categories. Um, they are versions of multi categories that are built out of the FC monad, this free category monad. Okay, and this is, um, I mean, I don't know if this is due to Leinster, but the, a good resource for this is uh, Leinster's Higher Operads um, book. Okay, I think it's uh, chapter five. Okay, um, so let's see what is actually happening here. So if we take a span in graph, and now try to forget all the crazy stuff I just did with spans. Um, this is just an ordinary span in graph. We have two graphs, G, G1 and G0, and we have two graph homomorphisms, DOM and COD, domain and codomain, from G1 to G0. Okay, so what is an alpha in, uh, in G1? What is an edge in G1? Okay, so if alpha is in if alpha is an edge in G1, I'm going to draw it like this. Um, and you'll see in a second that I'm justified in drawing it that way, like a double uh, map. Okay. I can take its domain and its codomain. Okay. And its domain and its codomain now are in the edges of G0. So I'm justified in drawing them as arrows. So we have uh, a domain arrow and a codomain arrow. Okay. 
But on the other hand, uh, G1 is a graph, and so I can take the source and target of alpha. And so if I take the source and target of alpha, I get another uh, two things, okay? And I'm drawing these as arrows because they have a domain and a codomain, okay? Um, and I'm justified in organizing these as a square because the codomain function um, morphism is a graph homomorphism, meaning that it satisfies an equality, namely that the target of the codomain is the codomain of the target. And so an object here, uh, this is the same object no matter which way I get it, okay? And obviously the same thing happens for all four corners. Okay, so this is the primordial data of a double category. In order to make this a double category, you need to do something else, but I'm not gonna go down that route. Okay, uh, if you wanna see what happens, you can look in, uh, in Leinster. Okay. Um, and so if I wanna change, if I wanna talk about uh, virtual double categories, um, I can just change the domain. So if I change the domain to be FC, of G0, namely paths in G0, then the domain is a path of edges. Okay? And so this corresponds to virtual double categories. Um, and again, this is just the raw data. In order to actually get a virtual double category, we need something else. Okay? But we're going to take this type of uh, construction uh, and run with it to try to get a simplicial version of this. So if you look in Shulman's paper, oh, there should be one L here. If you look in Shulman and Crutwell's uh, paper, um, the categories correspond to spans and uh, the virtual categories or um, the Kleisen categories correspond to these, this horizontal Kleisley, uh, sorry, this horizontal Kleisley construction on spans. Okay, so the horizontal Kleisley construction takes the domain and applies the monad to that domain. Okay, so um, what's happening uh, behind the scenes? Well, we have certain shapes that correspond to certain concepts. So um, we have a shape on the left. This is going to be like the morphisms and the objects of a category. And so this shape realized in a category would be like an internal category. Um, if I split up the objects and I talk about the domain um, and I flag the domain to uh, be, to, to say apply the monad to the domain, but don't apply the monad to the codomain, I get like a Kleisley internal category. Okay, and so if I want to do this for some partial objects, I need Need to do something similar. I have the uh, simplex category, which allows me to create simplicial objects in a category. So what would be the Kleisley simplicial category? Okay, so here's what we do. Um, we're going to take a bunch of copies of the objects. So if you look up here um, in the original uh, Kleisley internal category uh, that is in Schulman, uh, we are we split up the objects into a domain and a codomain, and we flag one of the objects to have an application of the monad T. So what we're going to do is the same thing. We're going to take the objects of delta. We're going to call them delta R n, and the R flags how many times we apply the monad T. Okay, and we're going to rearrange the face maps to mimic the Kleisley construction the same way that we rearrange the face maps up here. Um, and we're going to connect everything back together using the unit and co-unit of the monad. Okay. All right. So here's what we get if we try to do that. Um, and you know, th this might seem a little complicated, but if you just focus on the center here, this uh, Kleisley simplex category has faces and degeneracy maps just like the ordinary simplex category. Um, 
nothing is different except that the last map is flagged to have an application of the um, of the monad. Okay, and I'll show you an example in a moment. So um, if I want to talk about a Claisley simplicial object, I want to talk about functors from this Claisley simplex category into my category C. And what this does is this, if I apply it to the rth um, delta, so delta rn, the r tells me how many times I need to apply um, my monad T, okay? Um, all right, so let's see what happens for uh, a, a graph. So let's see what happens when our category is the category of graphs and our monad is the free category um, construction, free category monad. So I'm gonna start off with a simplex, um, an edge in this graph. So sigma two is a graph. Uh, and so I'm talking about an edge in sigma two. So since it's an edge, so this is an edge. So since it's an edge, uh, I can take its source and target. So I'll take its source and target. So this is in the, um, the set of vertices of sigma two, and that should look like an ordinary simplex. Okay. Um, and so now the question is, how do I get the faces of this simplex? Okay, so I'm going to first ask, what is the zeroth face? So for those of you who haven't worked with simplicial sets, asking what the zeroth face is, is asking what the face um, adjacent from zero is. So it'll be this face, okay? So if I do that, if I travel down F0, uh, I should get some sort of face here. Uh, and I need to know like what the domain and codomain, so the domain and codomain of this is. Well, if I look at its domain, that's like looking at F0. So it's just gonna be a single element. But if I look at its codomain, well, it's going to be a path of elements. So a path of elements. Okay, this is starting to look uh, like a virtual double category, except more simplicial. Um, so now I'm going to ask what is the, the two face? So the face that's across from two. So if I do that, if I look at the two face, so F2, um, I'm going to get a path of one cells. So I have a bunch of one cells lined up in a path, okay? And so I'm asking now, what is the domain and the codomain? Well, the domain, that's simple. I get the original path. Let me draw it in purple. I get the original path, let's do blue, from the other face. But if I look at the codomain, or sorry, the domain, I'm gonna end up with a path of paths. And so that's exactly what I'll draw down here. So in this case, I am looking at F2 and then I'm looking at the domain. And so I get a path of paths, okay? Now, this isn't the only way uh, in which I can get this face, okay? I could have also uh, looked at the back. So the back would be um, F3, sorry, not F3, uh, F1, it's adjacent from one. And then I look at the domain, so that would be uh, F1 of F1. Okay, so I'd be going down like this. And you see that there's a discrepancy. So let me just go down a slide. So um, on the top, we have this cell, that's this cell here. And we also have this cell, which should also be this cell, but there's a discrepancy. And that discrepancy is exactly the, um, the multiplication of the monad. 
So the multiplication of the path monad is to take a path of paths and just realize it as one long path. Okay? And so that's exactly what is going to happen. So this mu is going to map uh, the path that we got from one face to the path that we got from another face. Okay? And so we're justified in drawing it like this shape. Okay? Now, um, let's try to speed up a little bit here. So there is a result that I, I don't necessarily think I can get into, um, which essentially says that the vertices, uh, so the vertices, so the vertices will correspond to these side simplices. The vertices of uh, a um, of a simplicial graph like this, a simplicial FC graph like this, um, are simplicial sets, like on the nose. And so I'm justified in drawing it as a simplicial set. And so um, if I want to call this general construction a simplicial virtual double set, um, I will call it a simplicial virtual double category if the underlying simplicial set of vertices um, is the nerve of some category. Okay, and the reason I want to do this is that if I look up here, I want to be able to say that this is some uh, map G, this is some map H, and this is some map H of G, and this simplex is just saying that these things compose. It's not some extra information. Okay. So um, this is the right uh, structure to talk about, namely because this span construction that I talked about before is a simplicial uh, virtual double category. Namely, uh, its underlying category is C, and the one cells are spans of spans. And likewise, the category of ontologies and ontological transformations is a simplicial virtual double category. Okay? All right. So, this got sort of complicated. Um, so, let me just step back a little bit. All right, so I have now contained ontologies in some form of uh, collection of things. So I have contained ontologies in some other ontology, namely a simplicial virtual double category. So my next question is, um, how do I talk about the Unita lemma in a simplicial virtual double category? Okay, so I mean, why do I care? So first of all, um, just a reminder of what's going on in the setting of ontologies and ontological transformations, they are sort of like expansions of graphs. Um, so the cells are witnessing the composition of the expansion of graphs. Okay, so let's step back even further. Why do we care about the expansions of graph? Well, we are seeking a criteria for when an ontology has enough information to describe its objects from the ambient ontology. Okay, so the question is, like, when does a graph expansion like this, so expansion, satisfy similar properties to the Yoneda lemma, uh, the Yoneda embedding? Okay, um, so it seems like I'm sort of running out on time, so I'll try to breeze through this next part since it's really just widely available in the, in the literature. Um, well, let's talk about the Yoneda lemma. Um, the Yoneda lemma says that uh, the natural transformations from the representable functor into an arbitrary pre-sheaf, uh, if we evaluate that, we get um, the pre-sheaf evaluated at that representing object. We can make this Yoneda lemma like much more complicated, a parameterized version of it for pro functors, which looks like this. Now you don't have to understand this. In fact, every time I look at this, I have to try to remember what this means. Um, so let's try to make this simpler. We'll make it simpler by uh, currying everything. 
So everything that is involved in uh, this version of the innate lemma is a profunctor or a bifunctor of some sort. Um, and so we can curry it. We'll curry it so that the um, pre-sheaf construction is on the right in each case. And then we can talk about the innate lemma, the curried version of the innate lemma looking like this. Okay. So this one has less parentheses, but it's not any more, um, uh, it, you know, it, it, when you look at this, you don't necessarily know immediately what it means. You have to open everything up. Um, and so what Street and Walters did, which I love, um, is abstract this even further by considering uh, this equation as a universal property in A2 category. So it's going to, uh, so the, the Uneda lemma is essentially saying that um, this diagram here, which involves the Uneda embedding, uh, some functor and some composition of a functor and some arbitrary pre-sheaf, or sorry, some arbitrary uh, profunctor, it's saying that this um, middle diagram is a left extension. Okay, and so what does a left extension mean? Well, it means that if I have a morphism uh, from this canonical structure into an arbitrary structure, um, I can pre-compose by this two morphism, and this is exactly this isomorphism above, which was the original Yonea lemma. Okay, um, so I, you know if you haven't read this paper, um, it's called Two Yonea Structures, uh, and you're still questioning the Yonea lemma. You should probably just read this paper because um, it makes the Yonea lemma seem a lot more uh, simple. Um, maybe that's just for me, but. Well, anyway, so what Street and Walters uh, do is that they uh, abstract away from the uh, two category of categories and they talk about the Oneida lemma in an arbitrary two category. So what would that look like? Well, we have this pre-sheaf construction below. Um, so this is going to be like AOP to set, the pre-sheaves into set. And we have a Yoneda embedding from A into the pre-sheaves, just like we did before, uh, except for the fact that this is formal. These aren't necessarily the pre-sheaves, they're just something formal. And what the, uh, what the property of this is, is that if we compare any uh, functor or any morphism in our two category to this Yoneda embedding, we will immediately get a diagram that looks like this. Okay, um, so this diagram is, uh, the, the properties on this diagram is that it is an extension, like it was before, except now I can talk about it in two categories, and it's also a lift. Okay, so um, just to detail what that means, uh, a lift says that we have a isomorphism uh, sorry, an extension says that we have an isomorphism between uh, these outer cells, like this, and the right-hand cell, Ooh, I shouldn't use red, and the right-hand cell, like this. And that isomorphism is given exactly by precomposition with chi f. Okay? And there's another form of this uh, called the lift, and it does something similar. It's just another version of the innate lemma. Uh, and the point is that if we have both of these, this is a Yoneda structure. Okay, so this is almost good enough. We want to do this for uh, virtual double categories so that we can apply it to ontologies. So we want a Yoneda criteria for some ontological transformation into itself. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to realize the abstract unit embedding as a horizontal morphism in a virtual double category. And so that's easy. I mean, we did it formally in two categories. So let's just do it formally again in a virtual double category. And I'm almost done. Uh, so 
what the condition then becomes is if I have this so-called Yoneda embedding um, or Yoneda ontological transformation in my virtual double category, and I compare it with a functor, um, sorry, with a, with a vertical morphism, uh, F, I should be able to derive a Cartesian cell. Uh, and so Cartesian is the relevant notion of extension, but for, um, but for virtual double categories. And the Cartesian-ness is literally an isomorphism between cells that's given by precomposition with chi f, the same way that we did it um, with, in, in the two categories. And of course, the same thing is gonna happen for lifts. We get a different diagram and a different isomorphism. Um, so let me just end by saying that in order to uh, talk about the two different uh, extensions that we derive from the Oneida uh, ontological transformation, we actually need this to be a virtual equipment. Okay, that's really what uh, Schulman and Crutwell's paper is about. It's about um, virtual equipments. And in a virtual equipment, I can exchange uh, vertical morphisms in a cell like this uh, into horizontal morphisms in a certain sense. Okay, so the question, which is yet to be answered, is what is the correct notion of a simplicial virtual equipment? Okay, and if I answer that question, which I'm not so sure it's um, too hard to answer, uh, if I answer that question, then a Yoneda ontology is going to be a basic ontology and, uh, and an ontological transformation into itself that satisfies these extension properties. Okay. Uh, all right, so I think I should probably just end there. Uh, thank you very much. But when did the Shulman Crutwell paper come out? I think that's uh, 2010. And the street is, is, is in the 90s or something, the street to Walters? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's typewritten, so, you know. Okay, any questions? Any discussion? Well, let's uh, thank our speaker. Anyways, it's a whole world out there you're talking about. <laughs> it's very nice, very nice. Um, lots to, uh, a uh, lot to take in. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you these slides. You can make them available if you want. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway. So everybody will see you next week. Let's thank our speaker again and, um, we'll see you next week. Next week we're having, um, Enrico, uh, Enrico Giorzi is talking about internal enriched categories. Same time, same, same, same planet. Okie doke. Anyways, thank you very much. Noah, no, thank, thank you, you very much. Very nice. Hey, nighty night. Noah, so, uh, so send me the slides as soon as you can. Yeah, I will. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Keep in, keep in touch. Take care. Yeah, absolutely. See you around. Bye.